to us in UK, dedicated economists, and there's also a lot of experience in the real world. So he has got one of the big venture capital funds. And he's also teaching for us. So he was teaching for several years on financial crisis. So he was uh, coming back occasionally for a whole term or half a term. And this was extremely valuable for our students to get the exposure of both sides, the academic side and the practical side. And of course, he's also a great historian in the sense that he likes to combine historical knowledge with actual knowledge, new innovation, and historical and economic thinking. And uh, we will have a feast here on his presentation today. And let's give a round of applause for Bill and Bill. Thanks, Marcus. I gather uh, from keeping in touch with things Princetonian somewhat from afar, because I do spend much of the academic year in Cambridge, England, old Cambridge, that it just may have been the case that this autumn, the extraordinary, unprecedented, and never again to be replicated history of the football team of the great class of 1965, <laughs> undefeated, untied, and nationally ranked in the, with the big boys, uh, that the total points scored by Princeton this year may have exceeded the total in the autumn of 1964. I think that might be the case. But in any case, of course, the schedule was much harder then. But um, I'm, I'm really delighted to be back. Uh, as, as Marcus said, I've had a kind of um, uh, haphazard career. I did my doctorate in Cambridge, having come from the Woodrow Wilson School in Princeton. Um, I then went on a 35-year sabbatical, as uh, it turned out to be as a working venture capitalist at the frontier, and then returned to Cambridge uh, just in time for the global financial crisis of 2008, from my perspective, to make economics a really interesting subject again. Uh, so I'm now back immersed. But all of my work as a practitioner, as an academic, is focused on innovation at the technological frontier, where progress is made by trial and error and error and error, where efficiency in the allocation of resources is the enemy of innovation, where tolerance of necessary waste is required, and where I must say I find the neoclassical production function, even in its Schumpeterian extensions, to be a thoroughly misleading lens to which to read the dynamics of innovation at the frontier. So this process that I've been both lived as a practitioner and have been studying as an academic involves three sequential, nonlinear, interactive processes, upstream scientific discovery, technological invention, for the technologies that really matter from the railroads to the internet, the deployment of transformational infrastructure, which when in place at scale, creates new economic space, transforms the market economy, and creates opportunities for exploration of what to do with this new stuff. All of these processes depend on sources of funding that are unconcerned, not driven, not limited, not constrained by immediate visible economic value. Historically, two such sources have existed. The mission-driven state and financial speculation, each capable of mobilizing resources at scale larger than could be expected from rational investors carefully evaluating the net present value of alternative projects. And together they have indeed transformed the market economy, creating what I call a three-player game. A three-player game between the state, financial capitalism, and the market economy, the ordinary world in which we work and spend and save and practice life in the using the technologies that have been deployed. So three sets of continuous reciprocal interdependent games with different configurations. None of them is a stable equilibrium. The, the, the metaphorical relationship to the three-body problem in physics is, is not an accident. So in one version, we have state investment and fundamental research 
induces financial speculation to fund construction of transformational infrastructure whose exploitation in turn raises living standards for everyone dependent on the productivity of the market. But in another version, we experienced this only 10 years ago, a world in which bubbles and crashers in the financial system spill over and liquidate both the employed and their employers, generating appeals to the political process for redress and relief. And in the third version, a third version, malefactors of great wealth, a great phrase that Teddy Roosevelt deployed at the heart of the progressive movement, malefactors of great wealth are able to exploit the political process in order to preserve and protect their exploitation of the market economy. I sometimes think that's a little too close to home right now. But let's start with the role of the state. There is a long history here. This is recent, a recently uh, fascinating book on how the demand for muskets by the British Army from the glorious revolution of 1688 through the Napoleonic Wars to Waterloo, rising from a demand measurable in a few thousand per year to a few million per year, transformed the architecture of Britain's artisanal economy, made Birmingham, England the workshop of the first industrial revolution. So this is the role of the state as a customer, but there's also the role of the state as a source. And in fact, a generation later, it was in the armories of the United States Army at Springfield, Massachusetts, Harpers Valley, West Virginia, that the concept of making things, making physical things by assembling interchangeable parts, that was reduced to practice from guns to sewing machines to typewriters to bicycles to automobiles. This was the technological innovation that enabled mass production. And of course, in the post-World War II era, this role of the state through multiple channels was responsible for sponsoring all of the technologies from silicon to software and onto the internet that combined to create the digital revolution. And in fact, it continued beyond that. This is the, the NSF grant to a couple of graduate students at, at Stanford named um, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, which led to the PageRank algorithm in Google, and if you like, one of the most profound uh, sources of the technological revolution's growth and expansion. Now, I want to pause for a moment with respect to the language of war. I spoke about a mission-driven state, and that mission has gained political <coughs> legitimacy, political legitimacy, generally through the deployment of the language of war. War liberates or at least the just war, liberates the state from the shackles of prospective cost-benefit analysis, when the costs are always easier to measure and to know than, than the benefits are. And this has been true of shooting wars. It was true of the Cold War. It was true of the war on cancer. And it was not an accident that Nixon adopted that language in 1972 when he created a mission for the National Institutes of Health, which has continued to this day where progress is not measured by whether each uh, project sponsored by the NIH, funded by the NIH, actually works. It's a broader, deeper mission where effective is more important than efficient. But not all wars are successful or even productive. In fact, over the last generation, in this country at least, We've seen the debasement of the language of war from Vietnam to Iraq by way of the war on drugs. And here's the kicker. If the state, and I'm going to come back to this later on, if the state is not accepted as a legitimate economic actor, then innovation at the frontier is likely to stall. Let me turn to the role of speculation. Now, this is a schematic of how to think about bubbles. The first law of bubbles is that they are banal, they are ubiquitous, wherever there are markets and assets, there you will find herding behavior, momentum investing, prices decoupling from any relationship with cash flows, past, present, or prospective. But not all bubbles are the same. So here we're looking at two different dimensions. The locus of speculation, 
and the focus of speculation. It took me about five years to come up with locus focus as a kind of meme for thinking about bubbles. When the speculation is limited to the public capital markets, the stock market, the junk bond market, leverage is very limited. When the bubble bursts, as it inevitably will, the economic damage done is equally limited and constrained. Think of 2001 after the great tech bubble of the 1990s versus what happens when the speculation infects the credit system, the banking system, where leverage in 2007 nominally was on the order of 30 to 40 times in the banking system. Effectively, when you actually go through to understand what was being counted as equity, as the equity base, it was probably more like 100 to one or more. A 1% decline in the value of assets effectively rendered the banks insolvent and generated the liquidity crisis that triggered the Great Recession. So locus really matters, but so does focus. Most bubbles focus on assets that have no potential whatsoever of increasing the productive potential of the economy, from tulip bulbs to marijuana stocks. We can talk a little bit later about where we put bitcoins in that spectrum. But occasionally, occasionally the object of speculation is one of those transformational technologies, like the railways, like electrification, like computing and the internet, that changes everything and creates a new economy. There's a long history here as well. This is remarkable work from an extraordinary scholar named Andrew Odlisko at the University of Minnesota. He's a pure mathematician. He publishes in the journals appropriate to pure mathematics, the ones where the only words in the title you can understand are the and and. <laughs> but some 25 years ago, he became interested in and then obsessed with the early history of the British Railways. And he spent an enormous amount of time in the archives. So this is the millions of pounds spent on actually building railways in Britain during the little railway mania of the 1830s and the great railway mania of the 1840s. This amount was a huge proportion, approaching 10% of British national income, when most of that income was embedded in the agricultural economy. This is the index that Oblisco constructed of the shares of the companies that had raised and were spending that money. When the bubble burst at the end of the 1840s, the stock prices collapsed. Most of these companies went bankrupt. Nobody tore up the tracks. Now, more recently, coming closer to home and, in fact, to my own life, perhaps why I'm standing here right now, the great tech boom of the late 1990s. This is some very interesting empirical work. The dotted line are the cash flows both internally generated from operations and externally by raising money in the stock market by young firms, less than 15 years old, in the seven super high-tech corporate sectors. And you can see that this enormous increase in cash flow is driven by a comparable increase in the cash raised by selling new stock for IPOs and follow-on offerings on the stock market, and in turn, enable, relieve the financial constraint, as we like to say, and enable these young companies to incre increase their R&D spending by a factor of about eight over less than 10 years. Again, the bubble burst. Much more money was actually spent on putting dark fiber in the ground. But when WorldCom and Global Crossing went bankrupt, again, nobody tore up the fiber. It was there waiting for Netflix. So the, the, the first edition of my book was published about five years ago. And it was a kind of celebration of this extraordinarily constructive configuration of the three-player game when the American state, essentially the US Department of Defense, with some ongoing support from the National Science Foundation, NASA, was uh, the, the sponsor, the early customer, the funder of research, uh, and the inventor indirectly through DARPA of some of the most critical technologies. And when the speculators accelerated and amplified the impact 
of the digital revolution by perhaps as much as a generation. But now, now we must consider the consequences of the digital revolution. And this is the theme of, of what I've just published, a kind of, um, the way I think of it as a very substantially revised and extended version of my work for the age of Trump and Brexit. But the first motivation for this was actually very close to home. From my life as a venture capitalist, and you can read all about this in the book, particularly chapter three and four, my I, I, I internalized what I call the two fundamental theorems of venture capital. Cash and control and corporate happiness is positive cash flow. Cash and control, what does that mean? It means the joint hedge against ignorance, the necessary inescapable ignorance that comes when you invest in startups at the technological frontier, when you don't know whether it's going to work, and if it works, whether anybody's going to give a damn and pay a penny for the, what, you've, what you've built. So cash, enough unequivocal access to cash, unequivocal access to enough cash to buy the time required to find out what's going on when bad things happen and enough control to shift the parameters of the problem. My experience that often, not always, begins with firing the CEO. It can involve shifting the purpose of the project, of the underlying technology. It can involve selling the venture for whatever you can get without, uh, rather than pouring money into a black hole. But enough control to do something about it. Corporate happiness is positive cash flow. This was the mantra of the fellow I don't refer to in the book as my psychotic me uh, mentor, extraordinarily brilliant man, who had this, this slogan, this saying, uh, put onto throw pillows in needlepoint so he could throw them at his CEOs to drive home the message that when your customers are giving you more money than it costs to deliver them a product or a service, you're not only demonstrating that what you're doing is economically worthwhile. You're liberated from the problematic dependence on external cash to pay your bills. OK, so I looked around a couple of years ago, and both of these theorems were completely challenged, rendered irrelevant by what was going on in the unicorn bubble. These, these startups burning billions of dollars funded at premium valuations by financial institutions, not venture capitalists anymore, but by Fidelity and such like, um, who in turn were not just paying premium valuations for illiquid securities that they could not sell, but were yielding governance control to the founders so that they couldn't do anything if their money was, they decided, being misused, abused, uh, and they were, in fact, dedicating themselves to sitting in the back seat of the car, nowhere near being able to get their hands on the steering wheel as and when it headed over the cliff. And this is a recent paper from the University of Pennsylvania Law School, which goes through in detail the kind of agreements that were meant, that were, that were uh, represented here. And of course, uh, you could expect what was going to happen. Um, these are just the two most uh, prominent versions. Um, but then there's also something else that was going on. Cryptomania. I've updated this as of a couple of days ago. Um, so here, think about this as the proposed alternative financial system, liberated again from the control of the state. Now I have to always at this point, I always have to cite my friend Mark Blythe at the Watson Center at Brown University, who likes to say that um, if you have to ask if it's money, it's not money. But this assault on the state's monopoly over the provision of money led to this kind of joint key recognition. The unicorns, the cryptocurrencies, each in their own way represented direct challenges to the authority of the state that had spawned the digital revolution and made them possible. The unicorns at the local level and markets for uh, transportation, accommodation, the cryptos at the kind of symbolically core level, 
But beyond that, beyond that, of course, what we've been witnessing over the last 20 years or more, the gradual accumulation to the tipping point of enormous transformations of the market economy through three different overlapping related channels. The first, the second great globalization. So the first great globalization documented and analyzed by Harold James peaked in 1914. At that point, this was in a world where the movement of capital and the movement of people was essentially free. The movement of goods was constrained because the two most important nations that were following Great Britain, Germany and the United States, both practiced protectionism to allow their infant industries, no longer so infant by 1900, to reach levels of productivity that were competitive with Britain and even more competitive than Britain could provide. At this point, global trade as a percentage of total world income was on the order of 30%. The second globalization, which may or may not have peaked around 2007, in this case, what was free to move were not people, but work was, as well as goods and services and capital. Work moved through outsourcing, through the construction of complex transnational supply chains. And in this case, global trade peaked at 60% of world national economy, generating what Danny Roderick at the Kennedy School calls the, the political trilemma. You can have deep economic and financial integration, responsive political institutions, and the autonomy of a nation state, two out of three. North Dakota has indeed deep, deep integration with the rest of the United States, economically and financially. It has responsive local government, um, even if you know, we could put the entire population inside a couple of election districts in Manhattan. Um, it is not an autonomous nation state. Greece thought it was an autonomous nation state until about 2011 and discovered the realities of deep integration. So the next is actually almost certainly as much, much literature, um, particularly call attention to the work of David Autor's group at MIT, automation. Oh, I should have, I'm sorry. This is a reference to Autor's work on the political spills, spillovers from globalization. This is a very interesting study. It was done a couple of years, it was published a couple of years ago, done over the previous three or four years, where they took each congressional district in the United States, looked at the exposure to Chinese imports after China joined the World Trade Organization in 1991, Marcus, I think. 1991? 2000. Sorry, thank you. So over that 10-year period, and then they looked at what happened in the primary elections with Republican districts moving to further right candidates and Democratic districts moving to further left, a polarization response to the impact of trade. But then automation. Now, almost certainly the impact, the economic impact, even if it doesn't carry the same emotional weight as the imports have carried in political discourse. The impact of automation has been huge. I would love to see more varied approaches to reading the political consequences. If anybody's aware of them, please let me know. This is a recent study actually out of Oxford that looked at a, a, a limited index of automation, the population of robots in roughly equivalent economic areas. And the change, the change in the Republican share of votes for president between 2012 and 2016. The curve is up and to the right. This is what I think we would call suggestive evidence. It's not conclusive or causal. But there clearly has been a major, again, as it going all the way back to the Luddites and the textile industrial revolution of almost 200, well, 200 years ago, um, a political spillover from the impact of technological change on the labor market. And then financialization. This is really quite remarkable. I, we all were aware, anybody working 
through the post-war era, the post-post-war era, was aware of increased financial weight. But this is a, this is a very simple ratio between the value of financial assets and <clears throat> US GDP. From early 50s through 1980, that ratio rises only from 1.3 to 1.8 times. At an annual basis, you, you really couldn't see it. It, it. it disappears over the course of more than 25 years. But from 1980 to 2007, it goes from 1.8 to 4.8 times. This is in the context where, for example, up here, the credit default swap is invest, invented right around here. At this point, there are $60 trillion of credit default swaps outstanding created in less than 10 years. Now, most of the finance, most of the financial instruments of the trading finance has actually been trading in existing assets, above all, property. And also, of course, trading in financial assets constructed as banks create assets and trade them with each other, not funding new productive assets, except substantially during that tech bubble of 1996-2000. Well, what was going on here was the, the manner in which IT, computing, operationalized modern finance theory, turned the Black-Scholes equation from something that Fisher Black had to write almost by hand on little pieces of paper and hand out at the Chicago Board of Trade into what could be on anybody's desktop uh, as an instrument for both constructing and trading these, these, um, these new derivative securities. Um, Donald McKenzie's great book, the, An Engine, Not a Camera, Finance Theory as an Engine for Transforming the markets, the financial markets, not a camera for capturing how they were then working, is probably the, you know, the salient text, much, much cited in the literature and certainly much cited by me. Not only did IT enable this enormous increase in the variety and type and volume of financial assets, it also globalized it. This is a Bank for International Settlements. We can all thank Hyun Shin for for this chart, it's become almost iconic. It's reproduced all the time. Between 2002 and 2007, the volume of US bank claims on Europe in five years went from half a trillion to more than one and a half trillion. Brit uh, European claims on the US went from one trillion to 2.6 trillion. This is the vehicle, the channels through which our uh, embarrassment in the mortgage market here in the United States became a global financial crisis. Thus, the digital revolution played a central role in the generation of the great credit bubble of the Audis and the global financial crisis that followed. I'm one of many who now think that this work by Adam Tooze of Columbia is likely to prove to be the most compelling historical analysis of the sources and consequences of the global financial crisis, which has generated political consequences that continue. This is, this is work that goes back through history, well before the, um, the recent uh, embarrassment, to look at the political consequences of major financial crises. This is the period the early period, this is, this is the full sample, the pre-World War II sample, the post-World War II sample. What they show is that in each case, there's a significant political shift to the right towards, if you like, right-wing populism visible in the nations that suffer through these crises. But, but in this case, and in this country, not only in this country, but perhaps more here than anyone else, the state had been rendered illegitimate as an economic actor and proved to be incapable of adequately buffering its constituents from the economic consequences of the digital revolution that it itself had spawned. Adam Tooze does a, a brilliant job of how at the peak moment of crisis from the autumn of 2008 through the winter of 2009, the United States did play the central role of the 
not only the Federal Reserve serving as the liquidity provider to the world through its limitless, unlimited swap lines, but also the transient moment of stimulus uh, in the first days of the Obama administration that helped put a floor under the worst of the consequences that were unfolding. But this broader political fa failure is the ultimate macro motivation for my work, this new version of my work. And what it reflects is ideas really matter. As long ago as 1943, Hayek published The Road to Serfdom an understandable, highly emotional response to the totalitarianisms of the left and right, which suggested and was popularized to suggest, to argue definitively, that any economic role for the state would inevitably lead to similar tyranny as had been the case in, in Stalin's Russia or, or Hitler's Germany. It took a generation, and this is important, it took a long generation for the ideas here to mature into Milton Friedman's, this was an extraordinarily popular television program based on a book that Friedman had written in 1980, and which was the, the um, kind of the, the, the lead in, the leader for Reagan's first inaugural when he stated, government is not the solution to our problem, government is the problem. This coming on top of the previous 30 years, when it was the United States government that drove, led, pulled, pushed, enabled the greatest technological revolution that we've yet seen in the world, without which things would have been very, very different. Now, fortunately, institutional latency really matters. Despite Reagan, despite indeed the Democrats' move to third way, middle of the road politics, Clinton saying the the era of big government is over in the mid-1990s. Nonetheless, the public sector of the developed economies of the world remained large enough to play a major role in limiting the economic consequences of the global financial crisis. Let me show you this, this eye chart. This is really why I needed a pointer. So back to 1880, this is the share of, national, of the national economy represented by public sector expenditures, including transfer payments, as it should, because they support aggregate demand for the United Kingdom, Germany, the US, and Japan. The two world wars stand out. Those are the peaks. Between the wars, Britain is the outlier. Britain is the, the, the debtor nation that did not directly or indirectly repudiate its debts this is very largely debt service payments. The US is down here. In 1929, total public sector expenditures in the US were 7% of the national economy. 2% at the federal government, 5% state and local, where the state constitutions required that budgets be balanced, and that consequently, as tax revenues fell, as the Depression took hold, spending had to fall as well. The federal share actually doubled under Herbert Hoover between 1929 and 33 when Roosevelt took office. That's because nominal GDP in the United States, measured in current prices, declined by 50% in four years. So look at the difference. Here, in the years preceding the global financial crisis, even the US in red is up around 35 to 40%. In other words, the public sector, the continuity in spending, whether it be Medicare payments or Defense Department <coughs> contracts or NIH grants, bolstered the private sector's demand when private sector investment, beginning with housing but including industrial investment, collapsed in 2009. It was not only an aggressive central bank that prevented or that reduced the potential for another Great Depression to only a Great Recession. It was also the sheer scale of the public sector. And by the way, this factor, even by twos, I find extraordinarily under 
recognized in the literature on the Great Recession and the economic consequences of the global financial crisis. So the US economy today represents a remarkable paradox. On the one hand, it's the home of the leading representatives, the driving forces of the digital revolution, the FANG companies, the superstar companies, more work by Autor, which looks at the role that they have played, that they are playing, that can be read in the, in the macro economic literature. And they're driven, their economic and financial significance is driven by what I truly believe is a new source of organic market power different from and additional to economies of scale and economies of scope and network effects. Network effects serve to attract people to one telephone network because of connectivity and the return to connectivity. But except perhaps from time to time the FBI, nobody was actually listening to the content of those messages. Now the fact that every interaction digital interaction is captured and can be monetized and also learned from such that the more data you have, the better the algorithms with which you analyze the data. The better the algorithms, the higher the quality of service, the higher the quality of service, the larger the market share, the larger the market share, the more data. A positive feedback loop. The, um, this, however, goes side by side in the same economy with multiple measurable declines in dynamism. So this is a, this is a chart that the Times uh, mobilized out of Census Bureau data, looking at the share of employees working for small companies and the share working for big companies. This goes with, it's another way in a sense of appreciating that across virtually every industrial sector in the US, the share of revenues represented by the largest companies, by the top four companies, has increased materially over the last 10 to 20 years. The number of public companies in the US has declined by 50% since the year 2000, partly a function of private equity, partly a function of M&A without ineffectively in with, with minimal antitrust uh, concern. The number of venture capital-backed IPOs, a subject very dear to my heart and on which I've actually worked, has declined by something like 60 to percent to two-thirds compared with the average that we had taken for granted between 1980 and 2000. This is another business uh, Census Bureau chart. The Census Bureau has begun compiling data on business applications, and they characterize as high propensity business applications, those that are most likely to generate jobs. Crashed by 25% immediately after the global financial crisis, it's barely recovered since. Various measures of social and economic mobility, uh, work by Raj Chetty, now back at Harvard, uh, show material reduction in social and economic mo mo uh, uh, mobility, at the same time as, again, various measures of the content of corporate R&D spending suggests a material shift from longer-term research to shorter-term development. And the largest, the largest uh, purpose to which corporate cash flow has been put in recent years, and most particularly during this current year, has been on buying back stock. Um, and of course, inequality has reached levels not previously seen since the late 1920s. This is work I highlighted here because it's work that comes out of Princeton. Extraordinarily, you know, very creative approach to being able to track back to the mid-1930s when unionization in the US finally was given legal political sanction under the New Deal, briefly, um, looking at union density, that is the density of members of unions relative to measures of inequality, the conclusion was that A, there's a very nice, very robust, 
inverse correlation, the greater the union density, greater the number of proportion of people in unions, the less inequality, and that that particularly affects those who are the poorer, the poorest, and the least, uh, the least uh, advantaged in the labor market. Um, and of course, it goes with what we all know from the well-publicized data. This is the income share of the lower half of the US distribution declining from above 20% to about 12% over the last 40 years, 45 years. And this is the share of the 1%, which interestingly enough, not only peaked in 2007, but then has actually risen since the global financial crisis. Of course, this is heavily driven by financialization, by the value stock market uh, recovery from the global financial crisis. And the, what I might refer to as the dark side of the three-player game shows itself in the extent to which the market's distribution of power, one dollar, one vote, dominates the nominal political distribution of power, one person, one vote. Now, there's another aspect of this dim view, this dismal view, which, uh, again, for somebody interested in the economics of innovation, is very close to home. And this is the, this is the exclusion of science from input into public policy. So those of you who have uh, your devices open, if you type the magic letters OSTP into your Google search window, you'll find multiple URLs. This is the one that is OSTP.Obama Archive. It's a snapshot of what the Office of Science and Technology Policy website in the White House looked like on January 19th, 2017, the last day of the Obama administration. Behind every one of those tabs, there's a, an array of projects, conferences, reports, people, work, programs. This is what the current OSDP website looks like. I update, I check this once a week. First of all, behind this, there's nothing. You can't click through to anything. Under this, there are, over the last 18 months, they've generated eight press releases. Eight press releases. That's the activity. So, having failed to respond adequately to the digital disruption, the US state has now officially abdicated from the next needed technological revolution. Now, if there had been no Cold War, no Korea, the digital evolution would nonetheless have proceeded. It would have taken longer. It would have been less disruptive. But AT&T and IBM in 1945 were already working on going from analog electronics. This is where the transistor came from at Bell Labs. It would have happened. And it wouldn't have made that much difference, except for a few of us who managed to get the great tech bubble right. Um, but the problem now is that climate change won't wait. It's not waiting. And it raises perhaps the single most important strategic question that the world is addressing now, which is, will China lead? Will China succeed in doing what only one other nation has actually done over the last 200 years? Not just perform as an effective follower, following the lead of the leader through the processes of industrialization and technological innovation, but will it actually become an effective leader at the frontier? There are enormous challenges in moving from being an effective follower to an innovative leader. Now, all followers appropriate intellectual property wherever they can find it. That's nothing new. The British took textile technology from India and Italy. We took it from the Brits. The Japanese and Koreans took everything they could get from us, from steel to semiconductors. The Chinese have clearly done a, let us say, more coherently organized uh, process with greater reach. Um, but even when one reaches, a nation reaches, is in the process of taking advantage of what others have invented, 
they remain subject to the corruption tax. Many, many more governments have set out to get to the frontier than have ever come anywhere close because they've been compromised and ultimately have succumbed to the corruption that can be expected to follow when the state does become an economic actor. Some, the US in the progressive era, Britain in the 1850s and 60s, perhaps China today, interesting new work on the benefits in terms of the productivity of research in areas where the attack on local corruption in China has led to the removal of local officials, where much of R&D is, is subsidized at the local level, the regional level in China. China may survive that, but the, uh, the argument that to actually become an effective leader, the kind of hope and dream uh, particularly uh, represented by the Asimoglu Robinson book, Why Nations Fail, which has had quite a substantial impact, that you need to have inclusive political institutions in order to be able to tolerate and sponsor the kind of creative destruction at the frontier. You know, historically, that is a very, very weak proposition. Britain in 1820, leading the first industrial revolution, was led by a corrupt cabal uh, in, in London uh, in close affiliation with a national religious establishment, uh, exercising authority down to the village level. You may or may not have seen the new movie Peterloo by Michael Lee. That was in 1819 when the troops of the British Army returned from Waterloo, slaughtered peaceful demonstrators in Manchester who were demonstrating for greater openness of the political process. The authority of that government was legitimized by the fact that you could look over your shoulder and see, just a generation before in Paris, what happened when order failed, the terror of the French Revolution. But they're trying to hold the lid on the greatest explosion of economic wealth and uh, economic energy and financial wealth in the history of humanity. One might make a certain analogy there. It took a long, really two generations for Britain to evolve into a reasonably open, reasonably uncorrupt society. Which drove which? Was it the economic development that had the interplay with the political processes? Or in fact, is it simply an indeterminate question? We certainly don't have enough examples from history to draw any sort of rule, let alone law, of economic and political co-evolution. Think of them as co-evolving as they did in Britain, as they are now in China. So let me conclude. From the perspective of an American, this is a pretty dark picture. The fellow, however, the fellow who hired me at Warburg Pincus, where I've spent the last 30 years, used to say that you can't survive as a venture capitalist if you're a pessimist. You know, the first, the first startup you lose, you'll slit your throat, you'll be out of the game. So I'm temperamentally doomed to be an optimist, and I do believe, and it's not just because I'm here in Princeton, I do believe that beyond the green political shoots that we can read in the midterm election results, perhaps even more at the state and local level than at the congressional level, but beyond that, there is a source, a source of long-term optimism, which I lean on hard, and that is that ideas still matter. And the global financial crisis and the Great Recession, for the disciplines of economics and finance, have been the gifts that keep on giving. They forced the reunion of economics and finance at the macro level, perhaps most signally, most significantly, in the work that Marcus has led in the new financial macro, echoed by people like Elaine Ray at LSE and Caballero at MIT. This is a, a radically new approach that puts financial intermediaries at the core of the system instead of excluding them from the economic dynamics at the macro level. It's forced recognition of the behavioral micro foundations uh, and, let us say, reduce the plausibility of relying on the, uh, the fantasy of the robotic, intertemporally optimizing omniscient agent. Uh, and it's also demonstrably led to a shift towards evidence first, theory later. More work, more empirical work on how the world actually works than, um, than on how it should work if it would make our models 
uh, close uh, in an efficient uh, way. Um, I cite this. I speak as a as an old Keynesian from old Ca Cambridge. I'm delighted to always uh, salute the work from uh, the twin citadels of New Cambridge, Andy Lowe at MIT, uh, Schleifer with his colleague Genioli at Harvard. Uh, each of these books, in their very different ways, and they're all always subject to uh, comment and criticism, but each of them represent direct head-on assaults on rational expectations and a determination to try to bring into the stories we tell a clearer appreciation of how real people behave in real markets. So I close, I close with the quote from Keynes, the last sentences of the general theory that the power of vested interests, vastly exaggerated compared with the general encroachment of ideas, not immediately, but after a certain interval. But sooner or later, it is ideas, not vested interests, that are dangerous for good or ill or, or evil. I do believe that the new economic ideas and process of being generated in response to the discontinuity of 2008 will be, once that they inform the discussion and debate and decisions around public policy, that they will be positive for good. Thank you. We certainly have time for some questions, and I'll be happy to try to address whatever you may have. Come on, this is Princeton, no shyness. You all go to precepts. <laughs> So you had yes. this slide that showed that after every financial crisis, um, the electorate moved to the right. What, why do you think it wouldn't move to the left? I mean, why, why is that? The, that chart is, you know, I, I expect it's probably dominated. I, the, the paper is concerned with a long sweep. We have a few instances, of course. Well, let, me, let me back up and say, uh, Danny Roderick has an interesting paper suggesting a differentiation, and this is specifically with respect to this most recent financial crisis, between the, the populism of the creditor nations, which in, means Northern Europe and the US, and the, well, the US is both, and the populism of the debtor nations, which is Southern Europe and Latin America. The debtor nations, populism going left, the creditor nations going right. Um, Certainly on a case-by-case -case basis, it often will turn on the, um, the effectiveness of the political entrepreneurs who are trying, competing to take advantage of the discontinuity, the disruption of lives, the, uh, as um, Harold James has written about the, uh, the impact of, the, on, of transformation in financial and economic values on human and cultural values and political values. Uh, but I think that the pre-World War II is largely dominated by what was going on in Central Europe, as well as Southern Europe, post-World War I and then post-1931. Um, the post-war, uh, very much dominated by Latin America, as well as, as, as uh, uh, parts of Asia, uh, where mostly the movement was to the right. The U.S. in the 1930s, U.S. in the 1930s is really an anomaly. Uh, and it was a very close-run thing. You know, when uh, Roosevelt won the election, Roosevelt was in this long interregnum uh, that we then had from an election in the first week of November to the inauguration in the first week of March. The then leading political guru, Walter Lippmann of the New York Herald Tribune, uh, Lippmann said to him, you must govern like Mussolini. You must suspend Congress. The crisis is too great. Mussolini has shown the way for effective government in response. So the, uh, and, and, and by the way, the, the left-wing movements immediately after World War I were almost all uh, liquidated rapidly, from Vienna to Budapest, um, and then in the 30s in Spain. So there was a general right-wing movement after major financial and economic crises. Uh, 
And that's an observable. I, I can't explain in detail. I don't know if anybody can. Sir. Thank you for your talk. I, you mentioned something about state-led technological innovations, and you talked about how China could potentially become the next leader. I was wondering just your general opinion on, on state, the, the concept of state-led or government-led innovations. Are, because it seems like, for example, in China nowadays, you see the government pouring billions of dollars into artificially creating those city of AI or, or machine learning cities or gaming cities. But like, is, is, are those kind of innovations good, healthy for, I guess, not just for, for, for China, but for well, humanity as, as a whole? Certainly, um, that's a pretty big question. Uh, I'm not sure I can get to humanity as a whole. Um, Historically, we can look at a few examples and see that as and when, this is a point I, 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 I'm glad you asked that because I want to elaborate on it. It's one of the real challenges in moving from being an effective follower to an innovative leader. In the path of following, where you know by and large what the route is, you know, from, from bicycles to automobiles, from steel to silicon, um, identifying and, and, and bestowing resources on a small number of national champions it can make a lot of sense. The Chai Bulls in Korea, the Zaibatsus in Japan. Uh, JC knows more about this than I do. Um, but when you get to the frontier, when progress switches from being an effective follower to depending on that trial and error and error and error, you have to have players who can fail without discrediting the whole, the whole enterprise. In the U.S., as a great example, there's probably no more important enterprise in the United States through the central years of America's rise to leadership from World War I through to the 1960s, 70s, than AT&T. AT&T fought the notion of packet-switched communications, let alone the implementation of that in what was originally called DARPANET, ARPANET, fought it in everything from the, from the technical, technical workshops to the White House. AT&T became the enemy of innovation. There's some very interesting work. Uh, Wes Cohen at Duke University is one of the authors on how the small number of dominant Japanese IT firms completely missed the transfer, the transfer of value in computing from hardware to software in the 1980s into the early 1990s. Three companies dominated the Japanese computer industry. They were all motivated to build faster versions of their IBM compatible mainframes rather than understanding what was happening as hardware was commoditized by the technologies whose cost and reliability dropped like a stone in the aftermath of the PC revolution of the early 1980s. So whether China, there's an observable in China, which is the very substantial shift in economic weight from the state-owned enterprises to the private sector. Private sector may be a somewhat gray area, but in the US, so it is as well. Boeing, public sector, private sector, every jet plane ever made in America descends from the KC-135 that was the tanker that the Air Force paid for in order to teach Boeing how to build commercial jet aircraft. Uh, so this public-private collaboration can be extremely effective if the extent of reciprocal capture is constrained. Will that be the case in China? There's a, there's a very interesting paper. Um, uh, Storz Lawton, a uh, Norwegian economist, is one of the co-authors. It's called Growing Like China, and it focuses on the deliberate effort to shift resources from the financially rich state-owned enterprises to the financially constrained and much more productive private sector enterprises. I think it's an open question. The way I would put it, you know, I have this metaphor of the three-player game. The three-player game with Chinese characteristics is indeterminate, as all three-player games are. The only thing you know is that they will shift over time because the longer you're in one configuration, it's a kind of Minsky process, the longer you're in one configuration, the more pressure builds up 
to shift it as vested interests accumulate, as corruption has the opportunity to establish itself, and as political capital gets consumed. But I will say this, it does appear that in area after area, China is at the frontier, uh, machine learning being one of these areas, uh, and where perhaps the incentives for continuing aggressively to appropriate intellectual property may, may become less as China becomes a source of genuine innovation. You know, the U.S. The US uh, effectively enforced, did not refuse to enforce copyright laws through the 19th century to the utter dismay of Charles Dickens, who was pirated enormously in the U.S. until until a writer named Mark Twain became more popular than Charles Dickens had been, and all of a sudden, there was a domestic interest in, in, in uh, enforcing copyright laws. So we may be seeing this happening in China. One last question. Yeah. Um, I was just interested. So um, at the beginning of your presentation, you had the slide about speculation being productive versus non-productive. And it seems to me, OK, you want to encourage more productive speculation, I mean, if speculation at all. But I was just wondering, so like, as a venture capitalist, how effective do you find regulation, like attempt to, you know, like, manipulate the economy into something that's better? And are there, like, what, how would you recommend to solve those problems? Well, uh, first, I, I don't think it's up to the state to either promote speculation. I think it's up to the state to, or the Federal Reserve or the financial regulators, to be attuned to the rise of speculation and then to pay very close attention to where it's taking place. Now, I've been in uh, interaction on this subject with a brilliant financial economist, formerly, I have to say, of Princeton, Jose Scheinkman, who points out that you can't draw a clear, bright red line between the financial markets and the, and the credit system. They do overlap and interact. But I do think that what really matters is being aware of the extent to which the bidding up of prices is funded by borrowed money so that when the asset prices again decline, the invest, th those who are, hold them are rendered insolvent. When there's limited leverage, the economic consequences are much less, and the regulators can afford to let it run and find out whether it's productive or not productive. Um, you know, there's no reason, and apart from the absolutely endemic, prevalent scamming corruption uh, around the crypto mania, there's no reason from a macro financial or, 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 or prudence motivation for the regulators to try to block uh, what's, what was going on when Bitcoin went to 20,000, because there was virtually no leverage involved in it, and it was still on a relatively very modest scale. Um, we can have a separate conversation about blockchain and bit, uh, blockchain and Bitcoin and and their longer term potential for productive use. Uh, I think it's very constrained in for the original purpose. And that to the extent that distributed databases are valuable, they're going to be valuable amongst trusted uh, partners, uh, trusted counterparties who don't have to worry about proving uh, with the enormous tax on uh, performance. I mean, the point about blockchain, the key point about bl the Bitcoin blockchain, the Ethereum blockchain, is that their performance is awful. It's appalling. And it would be if you have to validate each transaction because you don't trust anybody. As soon as you trust people, it can, you can be very efficient. Trust is a really, uh, a really uh, positive contribution to efficiency in, in, in economic and financial transactions. So we have books um, out for um, uh, sale and, and bill signing. And if you have additional questions, maybe during sure. the, the book signing. But um, so um, please uh, join me in welcoming.